Um, so uh, this is the first ever licensing buff at GNU Cauldron. Uh, I, I've liked how the steering committee started with some history. I've met uh, at least one person here who was not born when most of the history of licensing of the tool chain occurred. Uh, so I think a little bit of history is warranted. Um, I have a relatively unique perspective on all this. Uh, I started my career in free software working for the Free Software Foundation. And one of the earliest tasks I was assigned was to negotiate with David Edelson about issues with GCC licensing uh, in the early 2000s. And so I was the diplomat on behalf of the FSF in those days uh, regarding toolchain licensing. And then after I left employment at the FSF, I continued as a volunteer on its board of directors. I no longer have, since October 2019, any affiliation with the FSF uh, for reasons uh, which are not related to this buff, but they're on my blog if you are so inclined to read about drama. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think what I found uh, when I came to Cauldron last year, because I got involved with toolchain stuff again after being away for it for many years, uh, because the Sourceware project uh, joined the Software Freedom Conservancy where I work, so that's what led me to come to Cauldron last year. And what I saw was Lots of people have lots of licensing questions. And what I went back and I talked a lot with Denver uh, over the months after I went to Cauldron last year about the fact that we at SFC are in a somewhat uh, good position to help with understanding licensing and dealing with licensing issues because we're not the FSF. And I know, having been on the FSF side in the past, that it's occasionally been somewhat contentious in conversations between the tool chain steering committees and developers with the FSF. And we're basically neutral in those kinds of disagreements. There are plenty of FSF policies I still agree with. There are plenty of FSF policies I don't agree with, uh, personally. Uh, but uh, my goal here, uh, and along with Denver, is to increase the level of understanding and um, discussion and open discussion about licensing issues in the tool chain. Uh, and I hope this can be the start of something, a, basically a new era of how we talk about licensing in the tool chain, given how contentious it's sometimes been over the last uh, 20 or 25 years. Um, I have a couple of claim to fames that are actually no more claim to infamies, uh, some of them. Uh, the first project I worked on when I started working for the FSF was the rollout of the GFDL. Um, I am proud this. I think I can say this publicly now because it's been 20, more than 20 years. Um, I attempted to talk RMS out of doing the GFTL. I did not succeed, <laughs> obviously. Um, I was a, a complete like 29-year-old noob at the time, so uh, my opinion did not have a lot of weight in, at that moment. Um, and the other thing, which is uh, uh, probably a claim to infamy well, as well in some, some circles, is that I'm one of the co-authors of the GCC runtime library exception, um, which I will readily admit is too clever for its own good in various ways, but it does solve a key problem that most of you are probably aware of, and I'm, but I'm happy to talk about that if people want to understand the history. But the goal is not necessarily to talk about history. I just want to give you a context of my history in licensing. Uh, and really, we just want to... Uh, I'll have Denver, you can do your introduction, and then we'll just like open it up to, to questions and discussion. Uh, thanks. So I'm Denver Gingrich. I'm the Director of Compliance at Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, and yeah, when Bradley told me about how many questions there were at last year's cauldron um, that uh, he addressed as much as he could in the hallway track, I thought, well, I, I better come this year because um, uh, because it would be great to um, to be able to answer some of those um, in a in a more fulsome way. Uh, so I I also don't have any affiliation with FSF. I I have been a, a GNU maintainer of a small program called WDIF, um, uh, but yeah, I, I have no current affiliation. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing I just wanted to mention is, um, so I've been at Software Freedom Conservancy for I think it's 13 years now. And so I've seen a lot of different uh, GPL violations in that time um, in, in my work, both as director of compliance in previous roles. Um, and, and yeah, one of the things uh, we see a lot is that, uh, you know, we ask, say, a consumer electronics uh, manufacturer for 
for source code, and then they send us something. Um, and oftentimes, what they'll send us includes a bunch of binaries of GCC um, and other tool chain components. And then we wonder where is the source code or even an offer for such source code. So um, it's a pretty common thing we run into. And then, of course, there are also examples of, uh, you know, for example, glibc being distributed on devices um, with no source code or offer for source code. So, um, so in my opinion, these violations are pretty rampant, and, and I'm pretty concerned about them. Uh, but yeah, that's just some context for like how, how I've seen uh, the tool chain affected uh, by licensing um, concerns um, in, in the sense of companies using uh, the software uh, without complying with a license, not, not saying that there are concerns with the project itself. So, so yeah, that's a bit of context for, uh, for me, uh, where I'm at, um, and how, how I'm kind of related to this. So, so yeah, we put these um, questions, this is just straight from, the, um, from our submission. Um, and so we're happy to chat about any of these questions, uh, but, but, you know, that's just, uh, an example, uh, what we really are here to, yeah. to, uh, answer any questions at all about and, licensing. And I think every one of these topics could be an hour long topic. So, uh, choose wisely. That's why we're not telling you which one we want to discuss, or if there's another one you want to discuss, uh, because we could easily get down a rabbit hole, which Ian's ready to take us down one right now. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, and I just wanted to add, I <clears throat> am an FSF employee. I don't work in licensing primarily. Uh, i have um, in chat with a licensing person right now, and so if you do have questions for the FSF, of course, we are, I'm here, and we, have, we uh, generally answer all of our emails with licensing questions, and uh, we do uh, welcome and encourage people to notify us of any violations they see possibly happening of uh, GNU licenses uh, for GNU projects. And as I told Ian at the beginning, uh, I, I appreciate that willingness, but also we don't want to put the FSF on the spot here. Uh, I, I talked a lot with Zoe, uh, who has my old job these days as an executive director of the FSF, as basically we want to try to collect and pass along information to the FSF rather than make this like, let's put Ian on the spot and make him like justify every FSF policy to us in real time. Uh, so so I, I, may, I may save you from that if that's what it turns into, Ian. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what I was interested in, are licensing violations getting worse or better because of whatever changes have been made? <laughs> That's I guess I'll first uh, ask a question for you. Which changes are you referring to? Um, well, I was, think I was thinking of, of um, ma mainly the adoption of V3. Um, but in, in general, uh, since you, you've been there for 13 years, you were telling us, do you have a constant stream of violation reports, or is it... Are you now getting more or less? Or are, are we on the track to actually educating consumers of, of, of GNU code, GPL code, and how, how they should be using it and what, how they should be making it available to other people? Uh, sure. So that's, that's a very interesting question, very multifaceted. I think the, the short answer, uh, in my opinion, is that things are not getting better. Um, I feel like a lot of the uh, consumers of of GPL code, um, as you describe them, are becoming a bit more entrenched uh, in what they're doing, um, and and it's very uh, uh, very unfortunate. Um, uh, I'll I'll get the list back up there in a second, um, but but yeah, uh, I think in short, it's it's a big problem, and it, it's kind of getting worse. And I think um, part of it, frankly, is just uh, due to not enough enforcement. So I think we're we're approaching the point where companies that we're talking to, uh, we we say, you know, you need to give us the source code. Um, this this is what the license says, and and they kind of stonewall us, and so. Um, it's getting to the point where um, a lot of times, and we, we don't take this lightly, um, and, and you can see from our history, we have not filed many of them, but a lawsuit is the only option in many cases. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's a very unfortunate and frustrating situation that we're in right now. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll, 
I, yeah. I have more thoughts on it that may come up later, yeah. um, the, but, but yeah. The only thing I'd add to that is I, I think over the years, compliance on like servers, desktops, and laptops has gotten much better, but at the same time, in anything that's not one of those three types of computers, i.e. the computer that's in every device everywhere in your house now, uh, those are just rampantly violating. And what's really interesting we've seen recently, this is just an interesting note, I mean, the glibc folks have been doing such a good job making glibc better than all the other C library alternatives, we're seeing glibc sew up again in embedded systems. For many years, they would use UC libc or one of the other libc options, and we see glibc appearing again uh, and violating on the LGPL for glibc. Um, so what has changed over the past 10 years or 15 years is that uh, before it was mostly uh, distributions distributing builds of the runtime libraries, so glibc, libc, and plus, and so on. Um, and now we have uh, containers everywhere, and people just run, upload random containers, and my understanding in that environment compliance with uh, requirements, any kind of notification requirements, doesn't, just doesn't have to be GPL, it's even MIT has a notification requirement, and people do not seem to be aware of that and uh, make the appropriate provisions for their container images. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think, um, I'll do, feel free to add something, but I think my initial answer on that is that, that yeah, the container compliance problem is really bad. Um, one of the reasons we don't tend to chase it at SFC as much is because the ramifications to users is usually not too terrible in the sense that the most common container violation is like a version of Debian uh, that you could build from source and would know. And that, at least that's my experience. And so I'm like, do I want to get them perfectly in compliance and correctly in compliance when we know what the sources are and we could build them again? Um, but if you're seeing other container type violations that aren't like that, uh, I, I think we would, I think Denver would probably be much more interested in pursuing them. Yeah, definitely. And just in general, if you see any violations, please email us at okay. compliance at sfconservancy.org. Um, we would like to know about it. I'm the person who uh, manages that that uh, email address. Um, and so, uh, and just as a, you know, related note, um, I think on, on what Bradley said, the the reason we haven't looked at a lot of those is just because we don't get a lot of reports of them. Like people are uh, mainly reporting a lot of things in consumer electronics devices. A lot of people reporting, you know, different uh, different flavors of Android phones um, with GPL violations and that sort of thing. Um, but but certainly, I can see that different areas would affect the the tool chain more than others. So so we would like to know if you are seeing some of those. Got to hand back there. How are these providers of infringing devices dealing with secure supply chain and software bill of materials requirements? So are they providing an accurate bill of materials that lists the things they're using that are not com that they're not providing sources for? Or are they simply failing to provide these bills of materials and so on that they're increasingly legally required to provide? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, maybe the, I'll just okay, go ahead. Uh, put yeah. a, a little note on that. I think so. One of the interesting things that we found is um, um, we we consider that if you have an offer for source code and you're in an area where the software bill of materials are generally provided, that you would at least have a software bill of materials um, available. And so um, I'm increasingly asking companies when I ask them for source code, um, could you also send me the software bill of materials um, uh, that you have um, if, if they claim that that is something that they have? And uh, they basically never send it to me. Um, so I, I'm concerned that there are just general problems here um, uh, with this sort of thing. And, and also I think that it's, it, it's just showing us that these these regulations are not really helping with the, the getting the actual source code. Yeah, and I was. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a good question, but uh, um, I, there's also the opposite of that, which is in the compliance industrial complex, uh, which is a thing, like there's just companies selling products all over the place, most of them proprietary that are supposed to help you with your compliance, there's this 
belief that the software bill of materials thing will cause everything to be in compliance. That's probably true for non-copyleft licenses, since the only real requirements, say, the BSD license is have is a copyright notice. But there's no source code in a software bill of materials. And we have had incidents already where we ask for the source code for the GPL components and the LGPL components, and they return to us a software bill of materials, which is not source code. And they say that's compliance, but, but no, it's not. <laughs> I think, and also what we often find is something that is essentially the same, which is that they give us a list of software packages that they downloaded off of the upstream websites with nothing additional, uh, no scripts used to control compilation for the specific device or installation on a specific device. And, and it's just really, really unfortunate um, and frustrating to have that because it seems like that's what it is. It's like the software bill of materials has turned into this thing that we use to um, make up compliance somehow. Yeah. And, and by the way, we, we would love to talk about compliance all day long uh, if that's what you all want to talk about. But you know, we did also prep, like Denver read the FDL for the first time. So if you want to get to some of the questions that Toolchain faces um, yeah, I, I, that, that are not the enforcement, because uh, uh, most of you aren't doing enforcement, we would be glad to talk about those. But if you want to just talk about GPL enforcement, I, we would love to all day, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I do have a question related to one of them. If people want to carry on with the enforcement thing, and I'll come <laughs> to it after, I don't mind. But, um, so DCO, um, I am very happy that GCC now accepts contributions under the DCO. Um, it's made much easier to accept you know, new, new contributors. That's the aim, and it works really well. Um, but most of the files in the subcomponent of GCC that I maintain still have uh, the original copyright FSF with you know, a range of years. When I contribute new files now, I put uh, copyright the GNU toolchain authors without a date, which I think is the suggested way, I think it's the way Linux contributions use DCO. If I accept a DCO contribution that changes 10 lines in an existing file, should I then be adding that new style line that just says the authors below the existing FSF copyright line? Because it's no longer 100% FSF. I should be doing that, yeah. It's complicated. The question is complicated. I should, I should start this answer by saying neither Denver or I are lawyers. We can't give you legal advice. We're experts about licensing. But uh, if, you, if you want an actual opinion from a lawyer and get legal advice, you should ask one, and that's not us. I can tell you the history of that problem and the problems that I've seen. So what tends to happen in all free software projects, including the FSF ones now, because some of them have moved to multi-copyright held. So, so when it's one copyright holder, everything's easy, right? You just put the FSF notice, and you know everybody's assigned. And you're totally right that now that many of the toolchain products are not 100% FSF assigned, um, and in fact, they kind of never were, but that's another story. Um, but uh, it, it, you have this question of what to do. Um, I've always felt, and this is more my personal opinion, that, that we were making a mistake by putting a full copyright notice in every file because the updating and resolution of that is a nightmare if there's more than one copyright holder. It's hard enough with one copyright holder, but with lots of them, it's really difficult and keeping track is hard. Um, I always encourage projects, and this would be a big change, obviously, for the the toolchain project they wanted to do it to just keep a top level copyright file and then put in every subfile you know if this if you got this file separated from our top level copyright file you can get it at this URL where it should be in the full tar tarball release um, and then you could just add the copyright notices there. It doesn't matter. It, the key thing to know about the way copyright works is it doesn't know for files. Like We all think in terms of there's a file, and then there's a file, and then there are different things. Copyright talks about works. GCC is a work, <laughs> right? Copyright expands across the work, and there's nothing in copyright that says, well, that file's copyrighted this way, and that one's copyrighted this way. It thinks of the whole work being copyrighted. Um, so I I've, think I've, like, we, we erred going back in the way past of trying to keep to maintain copyright notices in every file. Um, the other thing I want to mention and answer your question is, to my knowledge, and again, you should talk to a lawyer if you're worried about this, but to my knowledge, 
you don't have to generate a copyright notice for someone who gave you a work. So if I give you, no matter, say I give you a thousand lines, let's say it's, a, it's obviously a copyrightable work, but I don't put my own copyright notice in it. You know it's probably copyrighted by me. All you need from me, and the DCO does this, is an attestation that I'm offering it to you under the license of the project, which if I sign off from the DCO, I have. But you don't have any obligation to put my copyright notice in for me. Your only obligation is to maintain a copyright notice in the work if I put one when I gave it to you. So I wouldn't, personally, I would not worry about generating copyright notices out of thin air that weren't given to you in the patch. That would be my opinion. The other thing is, is I really urge you not to say copyright something that's not a real entity. Only people and organizations can hold copyright. So saying the GCC toolchain developers, unless there's a GCC toolchain developer Inc. or LLC, that really isn't, can't be a copyright holder. So it's, it's, it, it's not a disaster if you do that, but it is a little misleading. What yeah. Say it has no meaning in this Yeah, yeah, give, uh, give Carlos a yeah. little. We'll get Carlos and then Sidesh. We'll come back to you. Uh, Jonathan, if you ever have any of these questions, feel free to ask the GNU project maintainer for your project. Feel free to ask the FSF. Feel free to ask the licensing team. I think that's something that they can answer these questions for you. But the line that you're talking about is not a notice. It doesn't have a year. It's not a person. It's only intent is to say this file has been copyrighted by someone. Because if you don't write anything, companies have been known to say, oh, there's no copyright on this, therefore. And then when you take them to court and then they say, but there's nothing written in this file, they can't claim ignorance if there is a singular line that says there is a copyright here. I am not listing what it is. But it's the entire point of that one line, and it's not a notice because it doesn't have a legal entity, it doesn't have a date, it fails to meet the requirements for the US requirements for what a notice is, and its only intent was to say, there is a holder here somewhere, it's up to you to figure out who the holder is, and you can't claim ignorance when you show up with this file later on. Carlos, would it be fair to say that some of that experience comes out of SCO, the, the SCO situation from uh, 20 years ago, where the claim was, pieces of the kernel had been misappropriated. I don't know. I only know that the, the current position is that you want to avoid having nothing there. Like Brad said, yeah, yeah. either rent a top level file or you say someone holds copyright with this, you better go find it. Yeah. But you don't want nothing. Right. You right. don't right. want the claimant to come and say there was nothing there. Yeah. So, right, but the, the GPL, the GPL notice, if it's still there, would be sufficient. So, if you say this is a copyrighted work licensed to you under the GPL within the usual GPL notice, that would be sufficient to meet the things that Carlos is saying. And when I add a new file, I just put that line that is not a copyright notice. My question is very specifically about an existing file which does have a copyright notice, for better or for worse. Most of the GCC files have a copyright FSF with the years that is, you know, is attempting to be a formal copyright notice. If that is no longer, if, if the file is now 90% that yep. and 10% something else, I don't want to add, I mean, I could generate a copyright notice for the person who's added 10% to it. No, do not, just never, I don't yeah. want never to generate, do yes. <laughs> so is it yeah. sufficient that it has a copyright notice FSF just to say this is copyrighted, even if 10% of it is someone else not named in that file? <laughs> Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah. yeah. So the problem with process is that the more complex the process is, the harder it is to comply, and cost of compliance goes to infinity as you attempt to reach 100% compliance. So the easy answer that I wanted to give as a new project maintainer for this case was, if you accept a DCO, just put the line in. And that way there weren't any other conditional clauses because we could you could have a whole talk on this thing yeah. like there could be a bradley recorded talk that's like you know contribution checklist is like first step watch bradley's talk for three hours yeah, second yeah. step no. is like yeah. you know yeah. so jonathan the entire point was just process simplification no. and you and don't need to it doesn't need to be there it doesn't have to be there its entire intent was simply 
if there was nothing there, you better put it in. But that also complicates process. Yeah. We just told everybody, just add the right. line if you accept ECO. Yeah, and that's why my first suggestion was to consolidate the copyright notice to a top-level file and then put in every file, this is copyrighted work, please see the top-level notice for the any copyright notices. And by the way, it's licensed under GPL. Um, and the other thing I, I would suggest is, is, I don't know if this would fit with what Carlos wants to do, but a suggestion to kind of what you were going is, Carlos, is if it says copyright FSF year to year, just put comma and others. Copyright FSF, comma, and others. Now, I, I don't like the, uh, if you remember the Gilligan's Island, like, and the rest thing, where you're like, the some of the characters are not as important, so it's a little insulting to the author. But if the author didn't give you a notice to put in, in their patch, they probably don't care, so doing comma and others would be fine. Yeah, yeah and then you should put it in. If they do, put it in. <laughs> if yeah, I may. Okay. Uh, so, I come from the Linux kernel background. Uh, where the main approach is to use Git to basically track the copyright of the work. So what the, the one piece that may be missing here in, is making sure that when you generate a release or generate some tarball with the sources, you might want a tool that gather the copyright information from the Git history and then I'll put that into a file if you want to generate those notices. Some tooling could be done around that, I okay. think, to solve that kind of issue. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea, but this is like one point, I'll get you, I know you're waiting a while, but um, one, one thing that is tough to handle with the DCO is the, the default DCO that most people use, which I believe is the one you're using, um, doesn't actually speak to who holds the copyright. It just says, I am attesting that I am allowed to license this work. So you can't always infer who the copyright holder is, even from the Git log, because the, the DCO signed off by doesn't mean I'm signing off because it's my copyright. I could be signing off because it's my employer's copyright who gave me permission to contribute. And there's no way to find that. And historically, people don't include that information in their DCO sign offs. So just to get that. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, there's that too. But yeah, go, so go just to get back to the, the, the your, your specific question of when should I add the copyright GNU toolchain authors uh, line and whether I should append it to like a file that already is a copyright FSF, uh, you always append that. And I think the original intent, and Carlos, you can probably uh, confirm or, or reject that, I don't know, uh, was to differentiate between files that are purely FSF copyright from files that have FSF copyrighted code plus other code. Uh, there are two reasons for it, right? One is you, you basically figure out, make that distinction for whatever purposes you want. And the main uh, purpose, I think, is for, especially for glibc, is code that is shared with, say, GNULIP. So, because GNULIP does not have DCO. GNULIB is a project that is essentially mostly, uh, well, pretty much all uh, FSF copyright. So when code from glibc gets shared with uh, GNULIB, uh, the GNULIB project has that kind of awareness that now there is code that is not purely copyrighted FSF that has landed in GNULIB, and then it's, it's upon that project to decide what to do about it and, and how to handle uh, that, uh, that code. So I would say, like, uh, TLDR, uh, append a line whenever you add, uh, whenever you make changes, uh, legally significant changes, as the FSF uh, uh, defines it. Uh, whenever you make legally significant changes to a file, you append copyright the GNU toolchain authors to that. So uh, this is more a question for the room. So. There's this idea that we should, add, as BDX identifiers, maintain separate files with copyright information, things like that. And my impression, a lot of that is in support of um, end users or toolchain users, at least toolchain users who want to s uh, distribute the minimum amount of source code of the toolchain. And the minimum of uh, money, minimum amount of uh, notices, copyright notices, and just try to, I mean, minimize this uh, to do extra work to get to the minimum amount of sources. So 
I think many on the uh, more free software line side of things have come to the realization that in order to have full compliance, you need to support, uh, you need to ship source code anyway, even if it's not GPL, because there's just now cost efficient way to meet all MIT, BSD, whatever notification requirements, because you can't be sure that the top level file has all the copyright statements in it. And of course you can license a scanner, a commercial scanner that extracts the copyright statements. But that is, uh, again, why would you want to do that? I mean, you can just uh, uh, submit the source code. And my question for the ro uh, room is, um, is anyone, does anyone think we are critical dependent on this? Uh, is, does anyone think we are critical dependent on minimizing the amount of toolchain code, source code you need to ship if you are shipping binaries. And that impacts uh, how much effort we put into maintaining our copyright notification database or whatever along the source code. Yeah. Well, since Florian's asking the room, does the room want to answer? <laughs> I have something that's half that and half something else, um, which is that we contributed uh, lib uh, libctf from Solaris to Binutils about five years ago now and assigned it to the FSF at the same time. A few people have contributed to it since then, but not so many we can't see, see them with license change requests. It, it was originally GPL'd, but it's become clear since then that this is basically a runtime library component. It's, the, it's something which random, literally we are planning to use it for completely random C programs to introspect their type system because it's stuff that's emitted by the compiler. Um, so, so it should probably be LGPL, but I've got no idea how to turn it LGPL. I've asked on the Binutils list, and it was like shouting into a black hole. Nobody responded. Um, I even emailed Nick Clifton directly, which is really evil, and he didn't respond. It's assigned to the FSF, so who on earth should I be talking to? I don't want to minimize the amount I'm shipping. I don't mind if people ship libctf, but I think it would be a bit iffy to require them to GPL their entire program because they want to, say, turn its type system into a, into a type system that libside can use because they want to put a libside pro user space probe into their program. <laughs> and libside wants to use libctf, no. uh, and libside no. is not GPL. So it seems like LGPL is the only alternative. It seems a different answer to the question. Well, first of all, apologies for not replying. Secondly, the reason I didn't reply is because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have an answer for you. So it is. It's a very good place. I can answer that one. As an FSF copyright holder, you should contact FSF. Licensing yeah. at yeah. FSF.org. Yeah. 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 That, that is one huge advantage of a sole copyright holder is that it if a license has to be changed, it is trivial to do so. Lots of copyright holders, it is a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm going to throw in something about the SPDX thing. I, I, I think one of the, lots of people want these identifiers in every file, and I don't have a like problem with it as long as it's correct. And what I've seen happen, I was involved in a Linux SPDX uh, project to put all these into Linux, and the haphazard way in which they've been applied such that I have like now, I stopped tracking examples of where the SPDX identifier in a given file in Linux is just not the license of that file. It's just like provably wrong. And it's been haphazard because it's wanted so much of like, get an SPDX identifier in every file, do it fast. And it, you know, the, it's fast but wrong. Um, um, even the top level, so at the very top level of Linux, there is a SPDX identifier. It is not Linux's license. Linux's top level license is GPL v2 only, full stop, um, because the, um, the uh, syscall exception that Linus wrote, not everybody has contributed to that. For example, FSF GPL2 code has been taken into Linux, which automatically makes the whole thing GPL v2, because FSF, I'm quite sure, never granted the, the syscall exception. And it's like, these things are just missed. And so that's my, my big worry about it is not, is somebody going to use it to, to like ship the minimal source code? It's that they're going to think the license of this particular file is what's there because it looks definitive, but the work that I see being done to add SPDX identifiers outside of the toolchain community, I, I'm actually not aware of how far you are along with that, and I'm pr you're probably doing a much better job than most, but if you do it, just make sure it's right, <laughs> is the big and thing. And to be clear, I, I don't, like, from, from my point of view as someone who's looking at these 
uh, these GPL violations and seeing how to enforce it, I see no particular re reason that we need SPDX. So if you have no particular plan for that, in my opinion, that's also fine. <laughs> Uh, just to answer Florian's question, which I think was just, uh, as far as I understand, the, the demand for SPDX identifiers is purely, uh, which I think is what Jeremy Bennett was saying earlier, uh, uh, purely about scanners and satisfying them and generating s -bombs. I don't think anyone's, I, as I, well, I, well, I wasn't aware of size concerns, but you have a different angle on that. Yeah. Um, the, my, my feeling is that if people are going to source minimize, they're going to source minimize no matter what. Yeah, I we are, that. They're, they're just going to buy a scanner and they're going to chop everything out and then they're going to ship the minimum amount. I've seen source minimization come up in the Linux kernel space where people have said that, that like, they can just look at it. Now, where, if I'm honest, where this makes my life easier is if we had SPZX identifiers, then every time I re-import code into the distro, it just makes it easier. Like, the intent becomes clearer of what the author's code was. And with the clear intent, then we can have clear compliance and we can have things made clearly. Now, does that give source minimizers an easier time? Maybe, but I think they were gonna do their badness anyway. But at, at least it makes my, like, makes my intent clear. And there are some files where the intent is not clear and we always have to keep asking questions about these not clear files or we have to work with IBM or Red Hat or the FSF to relicense them to get them mm -hmm. so that yep. they are clear. And so I, I still feel like this would improve clarity and intent. Yeah, with that, I think the, 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 prob the problem is that the desire to do it quickly, like I was saying, has become such a fervor. I know you don't have to, but in other places, just don't imitate, just don't do what Linux did, is, what, is all I'm saying. Do it carefully, and, and I think what Carlos is saying is great. If, if, if the process of adding XPX identifiers discovers places where the license is not clear, it's done a good job, um, but if if the answer when that happens is ah just put GPLv3 or later on that's probably what it is right that's a disaster. Yeah, hey, go ahead, Florian. Yeah, you have the yeah, mic I mean, again. Uh, we can't control what people do with source, minimi source minimization, but what we can control is uh, if we, uh, I mean, to what extent we support those efforts uh, on a project level by maintaining metadata that they consume. And if we think SPDX identifiers are useful for us, then and this had this kind of unintended consequence, that's fine. But um, I, I mean, it, there could be like an argument where, where like uh, we say we want to see GCC, the GCC-based tool, and the GNU tool chain used in the field more, and this is hampering adoption. Then we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And my question was going in that in that direction, not uh, specifically yeah. about um, making things hard for certain yeah. downstream users. So. What? So, Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah. Else yeah, a couple do, but. Um, so I, I think part of it is, should we do the work of the minimizers? Uh, uh, because I, I think Florian's point really is because you wanted to remove the, the top level uh, uh, license snippet file. Isn't that, an, uh, I think we shouldn't have uh, do that work for yeah, others. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. So I, I think you are right. Uh, everything should just be in the source file, whether it's a, a license notice or SPDX and identifier, but we shouldn't try to summarize it ourselves then in yet another file. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and to, to, to the point Mark's making there, I, I was at the meeting where SPDX was invented. It was like 2008. The, the team was called False Bizarre Package Facts, I believe what it used to be called before it was SPDX. And the thing I said in that meeting as people were saying, well, if this was just, this information was encoded upstream and we all be great. What I said to the room was, I'm very concerned you're going to make an unfunded mandate 
to upstream projects who don't have the resources to put this information and encode it for you, you're going to have to devote resources so that it's not an unfunded mandate. And that has generally been ignored. Uh, Linux Foundation is funding the work to put SPDX in Linux, but I am not aware of any of these companies, the, the compliance industrial complex companies, coming to communities and saying, we will fund somebody to do this. I, I don't see that happening. So I'm still concerned it's an unfunded mandate. I agree that in some cases it becomes an unfunded mandate, and that's unfortunate. I think that in the case of Fedora recently, you know, we did have time, we did have space. I know, I know, <laughs> we did have space, but I think people underestimated how much work it was to switch in Fedora from the Callaway effective <laughs> licenses to SPDX identifiers. But in the process of attempting to do the SPDX identifiers, we found all sorts of things that we then had to go and clean up. It involved going to the FSF, it involved going to IBM, it involved like removing weirdo patent language that we, didn't cons we don't consider anymore like to be actual FOSS licenses. So the act of doing a like deliberate evaluation was valuable. And I still think because of that, we have more clarity in the Fedora RPM spec files over some of this stuff. Now, was, does it remain, uh, does it create this unfunded expectation in upstream? Maybe, but I think you, I really am weighing it against clarity of intent for us in upstream. What do we want to, how do we express clearly what it is that our licenses are? Yeah. Um, I just want to say, well, one, I agree with Carlos, absolutely. But two, I will say that to your point, we have had people come to us. So we predate SPDX. Uh, we have these license identifiers everywhere. We have them standardized, blah, blah, blah. Um, we have sets for them to identify them and so on. Um, but we predate SPDX. So we have people that come to us, especially corporate consumers, and they say, we'd love to, or, or we're doing an audit and we're using j in these places, but you're not using SPDX. Can you work on it now? Or we're going to have to rip it out. And there's this real pressure to convert to SPDX when really it would be, you know, semantically there would be no change because of, because of how we handle things right. at the moment. Yes, Carlos is right that actually an audit would probably turn up a few things yeah. that would happen. But there is this, there is a bit of pressure. But, but I do think adopting it where we can is worthwhile. I just think that you are, you are absolutely right about some pressure and about yeah. from, from corporate consumers especially. Yeah, of course. Of course. Scanners so, prefer it, so they yeah. need it. And, and if they want to pay for it, uh, so much the better. Oh, but, very welcome. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but, but it also goes back to my, my concern. I, I mean, I think this relates to where Florian started this, because I, I am very concerned th that the, the universalization of file-by-file -file XPS identifiers will create the impression that these files are all licensed separately and are not part of a larger work. Um, and when Denver and I see violations, what we see is somebody strips a binary, well, that binary has, uh, if it's a copy lefted LGPL or GPL binary, it has a corresponding source code uh, that's supposed to be made available. So to use the example of SPDX identifiers and minification of, of source code, if, if it's a glibc uh, .so file, right? So that's a binary distribution under the LGPL, have to give the complete corresponding source. If there's a file or many files floating around G, uh, glibc, which there probably are, that say SPD identifier MIT-3.0, okay, that's all well and good, but the effective license, to use Tom Calloway's term, of glibc is LGPLv2.1 or later, which means when you have those source code corresponding requirements, you've got to produce that MIT file, notwithstanding that if you separated it fully out of the project, you could proprietorize it, but you can't proprietorize it when it's part of glibc. And my fear is that the SPDX fervor has created this idea that, that each source file is a separate work, and, th yeah. and that's obviously not true under well, copyright law. If you want a, a sort of worked example, I had reason to audit all the SPDX, or a large subset of the SPDX lines in Linux, Linux kernel a while back, well, quite recently, actually, which was fun. Um, it's obvious what some of them mean. If it says BSD, it means this source file came in from a BSD project. Some of them say GPLv2. Some of them say GPLv2 only. Uh, you can probably guess that. The top level, 
says uh, uh, GPLv2 plus syscall exception, which is reasonable because that's what it is. But some of the files that contain the syscall implementations just say GPLv2. Now, does that mean that you can't call those syscalls without GPLing your program? Yeah. I don't think so. But does that mean this, the plus syscall exception in the, some of the some files is meaningless? Yeah. I have no idea. Of it. Would you but, tell me like it, anything? It, I, that's what I was saying before. And I know for a fact there are FSF copyrighted files that were licensed GPLv2 or later in Linux. So there's, I, I know the FSF never granted the syscall exception, so it doesn't exist in, in the, it, for the whole work of Linux. You could pull files out that maybe have it, but then if they're marked wrong, you can't even do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Do you want to ask about something that's not SPDX? Yeah. That, or, <laughs> yeah. So actually, the, the next point, uh, uh, how is the DCO actually safe? And it's mostly because I'm personally a bit annoyed that um, <laughs> I uh, 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 previously had to ask my uh, employer uh, uh, for a, uh, 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 can I contribute? And uh, they uh, uh, sent the FSF a company disclaimer. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's, it's nice that people cannot just do sign of buy, but like we saw by uh, with the copyright notes, even they don't actually know whether they or their company holds the copyright, and I'm not sure they understand or do they grant a company disclaimer because the company disclaimer that uh, I sent to the FSF back then was much broader than just the code I sent in. It, it actually said, this program, the company promises to not try to harm something like yeah, that. I mean, that's an excellent point. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm an, I'll just, just speaking for me personally, not for any organization, my, my own or, or previous, I'm in order to both sides about how the DCO thing got rolled out. I know from my time when I was working with the FSF that, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, I, I, I was on the board of the FSF for 10 years. It, it wasn't my number one item, but it was in my top three list to allow for contributions to the toolchain projects uh, un, not under FSF copyright assignment. And it was brought up at every board meeting that I was at, because if it wasn't, somebody else didn't bring it up, I brought it up. And there was a plan that FSF had put together that they were going to roll out that just, for various reasons, never got rolled out. And uh, and so, so I'm annoyed at the FSF side for that. And then, of course, GCC seems to have done it without really, uh, really working, really even knowing about that plan the FSF already had. And so it, it, its rollout has this problem that really bothers me. And when I look at multi copyright held works uh, and what's happened specifically with Linux, where most of the Linux copyrights being generated now are owned by about five companies. And they might not have the same views about the GPL that even their employees do who are writing that code. And I've always been kind of fascinated that people hated assigning copyright to the FSF, but almost everybody who works for a big company happily signs an employment agreement that assigns all their copyrights to their employer. Um, and so I would really encourage those of you that are doing contributions under the DCO to look into this point Mark's making. Like, it, 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 the ideal I'd like to see is everybody in this room contributing under their own copyrights, not their employer's copyrights to all these projects, and you should be the deciders of what's happening in your project, not your employers. Um, but but that's unfortunately, doesn't seem to be happening, I, I think, in part because the rollout was, was haphazard because of problems on both sides. But that wasn't actually precisely my point. It was more that if we already have problems uh, knowing who the copyright holder is, um, when people use the DCO, don't we have a problem that uh, people don't know if uh, they uh, 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 whether they are giving a a, a company disclaimer for? Well, I, and, and do you actually don't have to ask your company that question. You could ask the FSF, right? I mean, you could write to the FSF, and I'm sure Ian, that you could look up what his disclaimer said when it was signed and what his original copyright assignment said. And if you don't have it anymore, I think you do, but, uh, but, but they have it. If, you, if you've lost it, they, the FSF's got it. So you can find out 
whether your disclaimer still holds um, or whether your assignment still holds, because you might have assigned future changes, which means it's going to hold indefinitely until you cancel it. Okay. Um, I, I'll try it again. It's, it's more somebody assigns under the DCL. How am I, as a maintainer, know uh, I'm actually um, uh, uh, allowed to distribute this under uh, the GPL, and uh, I, I know the company won't undermine the project. Right. I, I see what I see. What you're asking, right? So, so this is this is the goofy. What, what, I call it a trick, but it's not really a trick. The trick of the DCO, which is, and this is a little bit of a danger, and, and you should be aware of this if you're making contributions under the DCO. When you do that. You are attesting that you know for sure that you can license that code under the project's license, in the case of most projects, GPLv3 or later, in the case of most toolchain projects. And if you're not sure about that, you shouldn't put signed off by, <laughs> because if you're not, because the liability is shifting to you, like you as an individual. Like if your company didn't give you permission, you've now attested to the project that you had permission, uh, even though you did the work for your company and, you're, and you didn't talk to your company about it. So that is a danger with the DCO, is that it was where it shifts the liability too, which is the individual contributors. Um, on the other hand, it's usually fine because usually developers check to make sure their employer is aligned to the contributor and so forth. So I, I don't think you should be checking that because they are the one who's attested it. Right. But what I do sometimes is I, when I get a patch from a, with a signed off by and I don't know them or it's their first contribution of the DCO, I will reply saying, you know, thank you, this looks good, you know, maybe with a review, but I will give them a link to the DCO page on the GCC site and just ask them to confirm that they know what that tag means. Like, yep. you know, That's good. just, just good to be practice. sure, you're not just cargo culting it yeah. because you've seen other people doing it. Um, please confirm that this tag is being used as we document right. its meaning. Um, and that way you're getting them to, and, and then if they say, yes, that's what I mean, your work is done. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be checking yeah. that they checked with their manager and he checked right. with legal. Well, and, yeah. And, and, well, another thing that I took care of a couple of years ago now is I put a patch into Git um, for in if you man Git now it should say for the signed off by my text should be there that I sent it in the patch that says in the man page of Git when you use this thing this may be attesting some to something for the project be sure to check your project's documentation before you use this command line option so that's another the extra check and balance to the process as well that's now there Mark go ahead Nick. but as a maintainer, isn't there still a risk that we're getting contributions with DCO signed by people who don't realize this? Oh, and absolutely. Later on, problems arise, and then the company comes along and says, no, no, we own this code, you can't have it in your project. And, and now my project is going to suffer because of some contributors' lack of foresight. Yeah, yeah, it's totally possible. <clears throat> I want to say about uh, two years ago, the FSF did get a legal threat saying, this code somebody contributed is... Um, is not is is actually um, a copyright violation because we you know we own this technology it's something and um, but that was a case where we had assignment we had all the all the paperwork we asked for before and that helped us when we uh, fought back against them uh, to squash that and you know we never had to tell anybody about the details and we could just go and say. GCC is fine. Everything is yeah. fine because but, we took care of it. That's part yeah. of the benefits. And, and, and Nick, your point is right as far as it goes. The nice thing about a copylefted project is the only thing that gave the person permission to create the patch in the first place was the GPL. So if they are not agreeing to license their work under the GPL, they violated the GPL by creating the patch. <laughs> It's a neat little trick, but it works. <laughs> the, I mean, there are lots of interesting questions about DCO and assignment. And the, the caution that I want to urge is none of this is a silver bullet. None of, yeah. like, oftentimes, point. even if you have assignments in place and, the, and you are supported by the assignment paperwork, people change employers and they don't update their, their assignments. People move on and do something else. Or... Uh, they don't understand how the DCO works. So we do have to always be in this process of educating the developers that are coming to our projects 
about the benefits and the rewards. For example, I still assign all my code to the FSF. All my contributions are copyright assigned to the FSF. That's my choice. And we need to, though, be clear and educate people on what the risks and benefits are of these things. Because at the same time, we face these challenges of how do you onboard new contributors? And what are those new contributors' requirements? What are their intent? And how do they wish to contribute? And sometimes it's about meeting them somewhere, but they definitely need to understand what the risks of, those, of the choices that they make are, which is nice that we have this boss and we can talk about mm -hmm. a little bit what are the risks, what are the benefits. So Yeah, pl plus one to all that. I agree with everything Carl said just now. Okay, so I, I'll repeat uh, my question from yesterday's GDB buff. Um, so GDB, uh, some people in GDB are considering whether it makes sense to move to DCO. So my question is, uh, given that DCO uh, as it currently is, is not ideal, uh, maybe it helps but not ideal, uh, would the GDB project be painting itself into a corner if it uh, decided to move to this this year now in order to get the benefits. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, do do I repeat everything? Okay. 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 So the question is, uh, um, GDB would like to. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, some people in GDB would like to move to. DCO to get the benefits of DCO, but uh, given that, um, I don't know, uh, maybe the DCO is not ideal, could be improved uh, if we move to uh, get get uh, the improvement, to get the benefits now and, and refine later, uh, is that possible or, or would the GDB be painting itself into a corner if move it now? I, I think I think that's a decision each project has to make for itself. Uh, that's me speaking, like for me and SFC. I'm sure the FSF has an opinion. Uh, you sh I would encourage you to consult them <laughs> and see what their opinion is. Um, but I, I, th I think each, I, in my opinion, each project should decide what is best for it. I do think the the, the nice thing about the the DCO process is that the Linux community has done a lot of work to convince the entire industry that it works. It has laws um, that they're easy to find and easy to bring up, but the industry believes it works. And, and, and so much of this licensing stuff is all just, uh, I'll be frank, made up, right? People decided that things were true, and now they're true because everybody agrees they're true. It's like currency, right? Uh, euros and dollars, they're only worth something because everybody believes they're worth something. They're not, they, don't really, they don't really have any inherent value, and a lot of the DCO is just like that. Everybody believes the DCO works in the way we believe it, that it does, but there hasn't been like a legal case where somebody sued somebody over the DCO yet that's established some known court outcome. We, 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 we don't know, but... Everybody's agreed that it's right, and that's an industry standard, and we can we can we can rely on it to some extent. Yeah, just wanted to complement a bit um, because I think I raised that that question, and we raised that because we have a problem, and we this year might be an answer, but might not be the only one. So I might just give you the problem we have, and if there are other options, we are going to be open to that. So I'm maintaining a downstream part of GDB. And GDB still requires a copyright assignment. And the downstream part exists for technical reasons because we cannot put it just yet, but that's the goal. At the end of the day, we want to be able to put everything in the upstream. And now we're in a situation where we do maintain a downstream part where we produce everything. It's fine. But cannot Part because we mm -hmm. not only go so we cannot to the FSF even or don't everything. Even if the person contributing to the downstream part are that doesn't express the intent that they to the FSF, so that doesn't work. So, you know, it works that for what is upstream, and we need a solution. Yeah, I mean, that, this is, I, Carlos, I think this is why other projects have allowed DCO contributions, right? I mean, this, but basically, the problem you're describing is what led to that, I think. The, 
I mean, the, the, there are benefits in that now if you have a downstream Fedora and you have you know, a thousand contributors in Fedora and someone finds something and they send you a PR and they go signed off by, you are able to then take much it. more yeah. easily take a distributed downstream that has a copy of your project and accept those patches and put them upstream. Mm-hmm. However, there are downsides to it. And I think the relicensing is, can be a significant risk, right? When the FSF holds all the copyright, you have, it is very different than if you have multiple copyright holders. But at least for glibc, we are already in that case for some files, not all files, which is why like when we did the SPDX stuff, we actually had to involve the FSF and IBM to clean up licenses. So, uh, okay. yeah. Well, I don't, I think Ben Utils Boff is next. It's a project and I don't, decision, right? Yeah, it's a project should decide and work with it. And, and, and my commitment, I think Denver as well, I mean, we're, we're committed to be more involved. I mean, I, I, mean I, I can't code that well anymore. I can do some of the easy hacks uh, in the GCC uh, bugzilla, but that's about all I can have time and do. But I do have license expertise, so does Denver. We're going to get more involved with the toolchain projects. And I encourage all of you to, to be willing to dive into this stuff. The, the technical knowledge that you all have is completely active. Applicable, applicable in the sense that really just being detail-oriented is what you need to do to be able to do this licensing stuff, and any developer is detail-oriented by default. So you can learn this stuff. This is only the beginning of a conversation, and I don't want to... Well, I guess I'll give Florian the last word, and then we'll, uh, we'll give it, uh, hand it over to the next boss. your problem. So we had the same thing with EG, EGCS and e, EGLibc, and I think there are ways to solve it uh, with FSF help, and basically uh, you can accept FSF assigned contributions to a project that gets then merged into another FSF project. So I think you should really talk to Ian and work something out. And uh, this is, should not be dependent on GDB uh, adopting DCL. 